All right. Hi, everybody. My name is Ben uh, from Drunken Buddha, and I'm an embodied processing facilitator. And I'm very pleased to be joined here with uh, Ryan Hassan and Matt Nettleton, who are the uh, co-founders of Embodied Processing. And so we're going to be having a, just a, a cool chat today about trauma and, and addiction and also its relationship to society. So covering the kind of things about, you know, maybe something about the link between trauma and addiction we've experienced in our own lives. Um, is healing from addiction possible? And, you know, how, where would one start and sort of how does that relate to the wider society? And, and what might addiction recovery look like in the future? Um, so we could just, yeah, I'll just get things kicked off. You know, when I think about, without going into too much detail, when I think about, you know, trauma and addiction and, and, and my own story, the thing that strikes me the most is just this sense that I couldn't be myself. Like it was almost like illegal to really express and be myself, that somehow just, it just tightens and tightens and tightens over time until it, it becomes unbearable. And that's sort of in my own archaeology of what's been going on in my system, my own emotions and things. That's just what the, the theme that runs through everything, really. So I know, Ryan, I don't know if you've, you've noticed something similar running through your own story or, or yeah, how was it? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I like the way you explained that. Like, it felt illegal to be me. It made me think, actually, during my time of active addiction, oh, I can vividly remember times that I had used and whether I had said it out aloud sometimes or even just internally. Um, I would oftentimes say, this is me, or this is the real me, because I felt, you know, uncomfortable in my body and being who I am in a sober state for decades. I didn't remember a time where I felt completely safe in my body. And so oftentimes when I did use, I would have that feeling like, oh, okay, I can be myself or I can be more like what I thought myself, the ideal of that version was. And that's what we're trying to do with, with drugs, alcohol, gambling, shopping, sex, food, work. We're trying to escape the the discomfort of being with ourselves in a sober or, or normal state, so to speak. And oftentimes that is because we have so much pent up energy, traumatic, stuck emotions, all, all festering within our system. It's a compulsion to escape. It's like a compulsion to escape what? Well, the direct experience of being me in this moment. Yeah. It's like, you know, we can, if we have a, a friend who all of a sudden it's that we, we hate them all of a sudden we don't like them it's like we've got the option to get away from that friend we can tell them to piss off and go home we can leave wherever it is but if we are stuck with ourselves and hating ourselves then we can't go anywhere we're always stuck with ourselves that's when we start to try and alter our consciousness through these external means to give us some sort of relief from the the pain of what it is to be a human being in that moment yeah though there's there's something really interesting here because it, you know, we get this sense that it shouldn't be so painful to be ourselves, right? It's like, it, this, that's almost what's so baffling about it. You're standing there going, like, I'm doing, I feel like shit. I'm doing all this, you know, using all this for me, it was alcohol. Like, it can't, how can it be this painful? So there's a, the word that comes to me is, you know, inauthenticity. There's a kind of, some, some we've picked up some sort of, our sense of what we are is not quite right or inauthentic in some way. Well, life, life's an internal game yet we are conditioned that life is an external game. And so oftentimes people that are really struggling internally like that, you know, and, and I had this myself, people would go, well, nothing wrong is wrong in your life. Look, you've got, you're married, you have a house, you have a high paying job, you know, you've all, all ticked all the boxes, so to speak. So it's like, why would you have this addiction or why would you have depression? Why would you have anxiety? Which just piles on more of the, shame and the guilt and, and not validating our actual experience because yeah life is an internal game it's like would you rather be multi-millionaire multi-million dollar house all the nice cars nice family all the things but be miserable or would you rather be homeless in the gutter and in complete bliss and joy like give me the gutter every single time <laughs> right life's an internal game it's not an external one but this the culture that we live in in the west is so materialistic and achievement based that it really adds to the stigma of things like addiction and mental illness yeah because i i was just thinking about this earlier as well because you know at school i was never you know you talk you you soak in all these materialistic goals that if someone had said is authenticity important they'd be like well maybe but you know doesn't doesn't matter like concentrate on your exams kind of thing no one if you are someone in the street, I don't imagine they'd instantly be like, Abs absolutely, that's that's critical to a life well lived is this 
Yeah, so the certain and, point- and the problem is the problem is then because when parents when we grow up and then you know they, they, we, these kids have become adults and they might run into some issues in their life like an addiction a mental illness then the parents invariably go i just want them to be happy that's right but but like when they were younger and it's no one's fault this is once again a very very cultural thing mm-hmm. it's like you know at my house my parents awesome you know very loving you know fantastic but we never spoke about my emotional state when i was a kid How'd you do in that test? Are you playing footy this week? Are you captain of the team? How'd you play? So it's very, very um, achievement based as opposed to internally. And, you know, maybe I go and play the game on the weekend. It didn't play well. And I would have these amazing like tantrums afterwards. You know, I would go into this state and I'll be so angry and I then I'd cry and then I'd be throwing shit against the wall. And it was never spoken about like, why, why are we having that emotional reaction and that kind of thing? It's like, well, you, you'll play better next week. And it's this, this hamster wheel of achievement and things as opposed to what every parent really wants for their kid is I just want them to be peaceful and happy. Yeah. And, then, and, then, and then a drug or alcohol becomes our only way to feel some sense of peace or happiness. And that's why someone keeps going back to it. And then society goes, well, you should stop that behavior. It's like, well, I feel no peace and happiness in my life at all. But when I do this behavior, I get a semblance of it. And you're telling me to stop that one thing that gives me peace and happiness. It's like trying to pull away a safety blanket or a resource, as we would call it, which is very, very unfair to say to someone um, who who doesn't understand that that's what's going on. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, Ryan. Yeah, I, I totally identify with that family description. Actually, it was ex- ex- exactly the same in in my household. And though from this state, Matt, what do you? We, we, we kind of lose ourselves, you know, that's what we've been talking about here, really. We lose ourselves along the way. Is it, is it possible then to find ourselves again? Yeah, look, like when you, when you said, you know, the link between trauma and addiction, you know, like the first thing that comes to mind for me is my life. Um, you know, like I, I grew up in a similar sort of household and like we're, it's sort of like a mass hypnosis that the ex, like we're so focused externally that we forget you know that peace is within you know um and like because we're so focused externally we do we lose ourselves we lose who we are in the in the external world and you know this the school i went to it was really like if you were different you you were punished you know until you and for someone like me that caused me to rebel um you know it made it, it embedded this deep sense in me that there's something wrong with me um you know our whole culture is is driven by there's something wrong with you and you dot 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 and you need to fix it you know so then buy this product you know buy this car you know get this job get this promotion uh take this pill take this medication there's something wrong with you you know and then that feeling really embeds itself in our, in our body it, it really becomes the felt sense of, of who i believe i am not who i yes. really am it's sort of like this false sense of self and that that's an adaptation you know so gr- growing up through childhood if i'm authentic and say i have anger and that's deemed unacceptable by my school teachers by my parents by you know my friends whatever and every time i experience anger i'm sort of shamed or you know even crying you know don't cry you know that was what i always got told you know don't cry and the friends are like don't be weak and teachers would be like suck it up and you know that sort of attitude and so every time sadness would come or i'd want to cry i'd i'd freeze and i'd shut down so then i adapted i shut down and orphan that part of myself but that sadness doesn't go anywhere it actually gets stuck in my body because it's an energy it's not just nothing you know it gets stuck in my muscles in my fascia there's a whole neuroscience to this and you know it's the same as anger anytime i would get angry and it was like go to your room you know or what whatever you know that that they said anger was unacceptable and the anger would come up and again i would freeze i would shut it down straight away so then as an adult, what happened, you know, anytime I was in conflict, I would go into a freeze and go into fear because I didn't feel safe feeling angry. Yeah. And so I have these ways I shut down, is that word, my authenticity. You know, I shut down who I was and I adapted to fit into a, a, a culture that really represents the loss of who we really are. It re- represents the loss of authenticity. And 
to be that false sense of self, that adaptation, which is a trauma response. That's exactly what it is. This is why I think our culture um, is traumatic to actually live in, especially for children growing up in our culture. And then what happens over time, you know, I lose myself completely and it's extremely painful. You know, I have all this stored stress in my body. I don't feel like I can be myself. And the whole scenario or the whole series of events that played out, like the shutting down of anger, the shutting down of sadness, the not fit, fitting in at school, the getting bullied, you know, that sense of there's something wrong with me just grew and grew and grew and grew and grew. And I didn't even know it was there. It was so unconscious. And I felt completely unsafe to, to be myself. You know, I was hyper vigilant a lot of the time, you know, like I'm going to get in trouble, you know, or I was completely shut down and unmotivated and didn't want to do anything. And in that state, like I couldn't learn, I couldn't cognize, you know, I couldn't understand, I couldn't connect with people. I couldn't be a human being, really. I was like a human being living in a cage. And so what happened, you know, when I was 13, I, um, I started hanging out with the people who were getting in trouble. Um, who were, you know, smoking bongs at the back of the school oval and all that sort of stuff. And I remember the first time, you know, I used a, a drink or a drug, it was like, <sighs> everything was overridden. Like I had confidence, I could connect with people. I felt like I could be myself, you know, my anxiety was gone. Um, everything was just overridden. And of course, I'm going to do it again, because as soon as it weared off, it all came back. And I realized, oh my God, there's a state where you know, none of this is there. And so then it started a cycle of seeking worse and worse substances. I don't think actually worse is the um, right term because they're all just substances, you know, but different. more different substances. Yeah. So, you know, and I ended up on heroin and I was, I was a heroin addict for 10 years, all as a way to regulate this stress that I was in. So my life was big spikes of stress and then using a drug. <sighs> To come out of stress and then it would wear off and I'd spike into stress again because it was all sitting there. And so it was self-medication. It was a way of regulating my nervous system and a dysregulated nervous system is, you know, what trauma is really. Mm. It's like what Matt's describing. It's like we're, we're trying to find home and home can mean that authentic self for that more truer expression or closer to that than we have been. And it can also, from a nervous system point, like Matt was saying, can mean homeostasis. So you have a dysregulated nervous system in constant overwhelm or in shutdown or ping between the two and will try and find some sort of external means to try and come back to that middle ground. Yeah, but and it, the problem is it is fleeting. And so as soon as we stop, well, we end up at one of those spots again, but we'll keep going back because that, I think Keith Richards had a great quote. He's like, the, con the contortions we will go to just not to be ourselves for a few hours. And that's what we'll do. I remember scoring drugs and it would be a nightmare sometimes. I'm messaging a hundred different people it'd take hours. I'd be waiting at the front of a dealer's house for hours. They'd be fucking me around. There'd be money, blah, blah, blah. All of this nightmare of drama just to feel not myself for an hour or so. And it, and, and it was all worth it in that moment because that hour was, you know, decades of not feeling like that at all. So that's why people go back to these behaviors, even though externally friends and family go, can't you see they're ruining your life? Yeah, I can, <laughs> but I can't stop. Now, most people in addiction, they just don't understand why. Because I did it when I was in an active yeah. addiction and people that I've worked with now come in there, don't I just like to get fucked up? Yeah, it's like feel, kind of the surface. It just feels better. It just feels better. That's yeah. right. But the question is why? And it's like, we've got to, you know, understand the deeper layers of that in order for us to, we, we can only make change when we truly understand where we are and why we're there. And it comes back, you know, just to what you said about the, can't you see you're fucking up your life? And you know, everyone said that to me, but what we're really fucking up is the external idea of what success, a successful and good life looks like. We're getting internal relief somewhat, you know, even and like by the end of my using, you know, I, I'd be, starting to get the snot come and the tears and the flu-like symptoms of opiate withdrawals. And then would come this panic, this unbelievable panic, like, like someone had just died in front of me. And so I um, would jump in the car and I'd be going through red lights and then I'd get to my dealer's house. I'd put it in my pocket. <sighs> the panic would settle and I'd still be aching. I'd still be vomiting. You know, my eyes would still be running and, 
like the, all the opiate withdrawals were still there, but that sense of safety that, or that sense of unease and panic, just from it being in my pocket, I didn't even need to take the drug. So that drug wasn't actually the issue. The issue was this spike of panic and an attempt to regulate that. I could sit with it for however long I wanted to with it in my pocket. I'd always use it, but you know, that, that tells me that it's not the actual drug, you know? Yes, yes the drug has addictive qualities, physical dependence and all, all that sort of stuff. But the issue is this trauma response that happens. And at that point, your system then recognized, oh, I have the solution to this problem. Fantastic. Yeah. We, we talk about, if you link it, we talk about it in body processing, about building a resource of safety. <clears throat> where we're <clears throat> sorry, <clears throat> cultivating a sense of safety within the body. And we can use, you know, memories, people from the past, places and that kind of thing. But, you know, when we are in active addiction, we've lost all resource, we've lost all sense of safety and we're, it, it's a human need that we have and we'll cling on to it wherever. So in that moment, the drug becomes that resource of safety. That's why when Matt, you know, can, can gra grab the bag of heroin and put it in the pocket and like you said, hadn't even used it yet, but something in him had relaxed in spite of the physical symptoms of withdrawal, something had relaxed because a part of him felt more resourced in that moment. Now, ideally, we want to build this resource with much more healthier means than drugs, but that, that's what they become in that moment. You know, a codependent relationship is the same kind of thing. It's the same kind of type of addiction. It's like I could be with a partner who's abusive emotionally, physically, verbally, um, all of that kind of stuff. But if they're the only resource that I perceive that I have in my life, I'll stay in that relationship no matter how poorly they treat me because the loss of resource is complete chaos internally into our, to our nervous system. And, and humans have all sorts of trouble tolerating that. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And the, I'd love to, to then get your views on the, the healing aspect. Because I think in the addiction recovery world, there's a, sometimes there's a sense that you sort of have to just manage with it as best you can, you know, find whatever resources you can. But, you know, I can, Matt, I can see there's, there's almost no snot coming out of your nose at this moment. You've clearly done something right, you know, <laughs> along the way to, uh, to help re-regulate yeah. that nervous system in, in quite a fundamental way. And oh, yeah, yeah. I'd be really interested in, in, you know, is it really possible to fundamentally reorient your system towards that, towards home, as you know, as, as the, the word that Ryan used earlier? Uh, I like that word home, you know, um, but you know, the, these stress patterns, they're really set up in childhood. Um, you know, the way our parents deal with stress, the way our parents deal with our stress, you know, how well our parents co-regulate with us. And, you know, my generation and the generations before, it was like cried out methods, you know, leave your child to deal with their stress, put them in the room and, you know, all of those sort of things. And so what happens is the part of the brain that regulates stress, it develops in those first three years. And it actually develops by being held and by the parents regulating themselves when they're in a stress response and you're in a stress response. So it's like a baby crying, it will spike into stress. And then the mother picks it up. It's like, it's okay. The baby will calm down. And it's that happening thousands of times that actually grows that part of the brain. You know, babies have no capability of self-soothing. And so our way of dealing with stress you know we can only deal with stress via external means and everyone's doing this in some form or another i say everyone's got addictions you know some are frowned upon yeah. celebrate you know but everyone's doing this attempting to regulate stress via external means and so the healing of that you know it's something that takes time it's something that you don't go to a therapy session for an hour a week and then it's done it's it's a lifestyle you know it's something that I say it's like, a, for me, it's been like an every moment yoga, you know, it's like the yogis in, in Tibet, you know, every moment is a, is a spiritual practice for them. And it's that kind of dedication and willingness that reorients and rewires the nervous system. And, you know, I essentially have to reparent myself. I have to feel all the feelings that were unfelt throughout my using and my childhood, you know, and I don't want to say, you know, all is like a big words you know, i don't think there is an all like i don't think we get to a point where it's done we've felt every feeling and now it's like i'm, <laughs> I'm bored Ding. oh i'm finished great <laughs> I don't, it, it, you know that hasn't been my experience um you know and 
it's like what so what happens is every time i'm in a stress response if i can actually learn to contain that stress rather than act it out if i can learn to feel it say i go into rage you know or you know um i'm in a relationship and i get triggered by my partner and i go into a rage and then the pattern is uh, like i act it out i yell and scream and then afterwards i go into a huge shame spiral and then i go to my dealer's house and use you know if it's the patterns like that so we go into these stresses in in life but we need to learn to come out of it you know we have to learn to re-regulate our nervous system and that's what rewires the brain the body you know ev everything in us because if i'm stressed i reach for something even if i'm joyful and i'm happy and i'm with my mates there's still an underlying unease if i'm reaching for something. some people say to me well this doesn't make sense because i use even when i'm happy and I say, well, you know, 99% of the time, we're not conscious of this, the unease within us. If you were completely happy and peaceful and at rest within yourself, that compulsion to move away from yourself would be non-existent. You know, so when I, I get stressed or that, that unease sort of kicks up, I can just check in with my body because it's a real body and somatic experience. You know, it's, it's within the soma. And if I can learn to be with that, and stay present whilst it spikes, it will come out and re-regulate itself in its own time. And this is something we build capacity to do over, over years. You know, if I, if I get triggered now, my body goes into like a, a freeze or a fight or a flight. It's like I move towards that rather than move away from it. And that's been the practice that's been the every moment yoga is moving towards all the parts of myself that I've been running from. Yeah, it's in a sense, when you explain it like that, it is in a sense kind of simple. I mean, it's it's more challenging to actually implement, but it's it's again, it's, it's that fundamental turning around. It's just, it's, you know that that you know you explain the way our society sort of says, don't don't look inwards. That's there's no nothing to see there. Let's all focus. Let's all together focus on all the outside stuff. One, two, three. Everyone, okay, good. You get claps and you know <laughs> and all the praise. You start talking about the inside stuff. It's like no, 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 no. So it's, yeah, it's as simple as that, but it, in actual practice, because it's so overwhelming. I mean, when you get triggered, the issue is you sort of get dragged along by it, you know? So I suppose when I think about it, I think of three aspects. There's sort of the containment or resource aspect, which you guys have mentioned. Then there's maybe a, a perhaps a bit of an understanding, have a bit of an understanding of what's actually going on. So it's like, okay, this is spiking, but it will, it's not going to last forever. There are ways of managing it. And then that, you mentioned that somatic awareness, that somatic processing, that ability to actually turn it within. So how, you know, could you talk a bit about, maybe Ryan, we could get you in on um, how you deal with the, the, the challenge of the situation, which is clearly that you're getting overwhelmed. Yeah, I think you said simple, but definitely not easy. Those two are very different. Simple, but yeah, very, very, very hard in the moment. We have this thing as human beings, whatever, emotional state we're in we feel like we'll get stuck in it forever even though every emotion previous to that through our whole life has come and gone like the waves of the ocean the current one we're in now feels like it's going to persist it's just this kind of cognitive distortion that we have and um you know being with those sensations often take time and a lot of practice and early on people do need a helping hand you know most of the time whether that's someone who's been through the fire themselves and come out the other side holding buckets of water, seeing a trauma therapist who can really metaphorically or sometimes literally hold their hand through those really big things that they need to process from the past. And then it becomes this process of getting better and better and better. And, you know, healing's obviously possible. You know, we're three examples right here of it. <laughs> you know, it was seven years ago, I would have to take tremendously high amounts of the most addictive substance apparently known to man every single day just to live, whereas I haven't done that since then. So it's, it's, it's definitely possible. And then everyone's got a different, I suppose, goal as well. You know, over the time, seeing hundreds and hundreds of people come and go through the Centre for Healing, it's like some people are happy just to stop using and do that bit of work, learn how to self-manage in the moment, deal with that overwhelm. And, and you know, we've had clients who, yeah, been addicted for 15, 20 years and they've stopped and they've that was it. They've gone and started a family and they've had things come up and they've kind of dealt with them as they go. Other people just want to go much deeper down the rabbit hole. And there's no right or wrong with that. You know, that's probably us three are probably an example of that. It's like, wow, I've stopped using drugs and drinking. How do I actually detox from my thoughts? 
<laughs> you know, how do I, how do I become completely free? That's a, that's a whole nother path. Like Matt said for him, that's like a moment to moment yoga practice of being able to let go now. And there's, and there's people who are in between those kind of two extremes. So recovery and healing can look very, very different for different people. And there's no, there's no cookie cutter or right version of that, but the, but the themes of it are being able to process a lot of these old energies from the past, these emotions, because, you know, these spoke about, can we heal? It's like our nervous system adapted to be dysregulated through whatever, that's very individual how that happened to a human being. But then the beauty of being human being is that we can readapt. Okay, we're always changing, you know, neuroplasticity, even our brain, it's changing up until the day we die. Now, most significant changes happen in those early years of life, because as we come into the world, we have to work out what is this environment and how do I survive? And so we adapt, we make many connections in those early years, but we're making connections through our life. You know, if I don't know how to play piano and then I start learning how to play piano, my brain will look different on an fMRI scan after learning to play piano because it's changed. So we can readapt our nervous system to be able to tolerate stronger and stronger sensations and, and not and be able to do that without that reaching. I like how you said it, Ben. It, it, it feels like there's something that pulls us in those moments. You know, I had moments in my addiction where I would have this urge come up and in my head I would say a thousand times, you said this is the last time, we're never doing this again, we are not going to score. Next thing I'm literally parking at the dealer's house, I'm like, how the fuck did I get here, <laughs> right? Because that, that energy just pulled me there and it was far too strong for me because I didn't have the capacity to be with it and hold it. But over this process of, of readapting over weeks, months and years, all of a sudden we can, we can see these things come up and we let them go. They come up and we let them go. And each time we do that, we build more resilience and get stronger. And at a certain point, the nervous system adapts where it's not even, it's not even a thing. You know, it's like me and Matt talk where it's not even a, like I wake up every day or I pat myself on the back every week or month because I didn't use. It's like, it's not a thing. It's not a for or against a good or a bad because whatever I renounce, I'm still tied to for life as well. So if I've renounced alcohol for life, well, I'm still energetically tied to that. We will ideally want to get to a place where these substances or behaviors are just, you know, there's no for or against good or bad. They just, they're nothing. It's just like chairs and broccoli to sort of a, yeah. well, they're, they're, they're cool. It's, um, I was thinking of a chair or a broccoli addiction. Yeah, anyway, a, a, a chair made of broccoli. Oh, I don't know. Um, <laughs> I, I want to make, yeah, what, what, <laughs> just had to introduce some silliness. Um, <laughs> What I, uh... <laughs> I don't know why that's so funny. <laughs> have to. I don't know. I don't know. How would that be comfortable? Honestly, it'd be all bumpy, could wouldn't sculpt, it? You could probably sculpt a very small one. Right. Um, I don't know. <laughs> um, I, hadn't, I hadn't planned to derail the conversation. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Like, um, because I, I say having a drink or a drug is about as relevant as having a banana to me. It's, you know, um, like I, I, I say I haven't been addicted to anything for five years, uh, substance wise, you know, um, but I've had a drink here and there. And um, that obsession and compulsion, as they would call it in 12 step programs, that's not there anymore. Um, you know, it, it doesn't get triggered up. And and that's because there's not enough stress in my system to get relief from the drink. You know, I have a drink. It doesn't feel relieving. You know, it just feels like a banana. Like you get a, have a banana. You don't get to start obsessing about a banana. I need another banana. You know, it's just, it's just a, another just a few moments yeah. in between some other moments. That's and that's, right. that, that's what comes up for people. Like people are, Oh, if it's like a banana, if meth is, then I could do meth anytime and I'll do it heaps and heaps and heaps. So like, no, you're, you're still bringing your compulsion to something that's, you know, we're talking about differently here. And, and, and you know, the Buddha 2,500 years ago, I think that's around the time, um, but he, he said all suffering is caused by craving and aversion. So craving and aversion is sort of a loop. Like I have an aversion to this internal state, so then I crave something else to seek relief. Craving and aversion are really two sides of the same coin. And, you know, I, I define that as what addiction is. Addiction is crazy, craving and aversion. That's the obsession. I have an aversion to this experience and I crave a different experience. So that's the compulsion that plays out. That gives birth to compulsion. And so when I say it's, it's as relevant as having 
a banana or a chair made of broccoli, it's that craving and aversion cycle is not there, you know, regarding these things. I still have stuff play out for sure, you know, but when it comes to my system believing that that gives relief from this internal experience, I crave that and I avoid this, that's gone. I've repatterned that that program, you know. It's like when I have stress now, like I said, the repatterning has been to move towards it and be with it you know i've grown in my capacity to actually be with my experience to be human you know without running from being human a craving and aversion is basically a cycle of attempting to escape you know and we can repattern ourselves on a very very fundamental level this is and i yeah. like to use the word program so it's 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 a really important word as well because it's like we guilt and shame ourselves so much for these behaviors, but we can understand that they are just these programs playing out. It's like, let's say that when I was a kid, every time I was in an emotional state, my parents didn't know how to handle it. So they just give me chocolate. It's like, here, here, okay, you're upset. You have chocolate, have chocolate. Then all of a sudden that becomes a program. And now I'm 35. And every time I start getting in an emotional state, I need sweets, right? It's a program playing out. You know, when, when I'm younger, I um, see every time my dad is in some sort of stress state, he reaches for a beer. Bang, program. Okay, you, we deal with stress by drinking alcohol. I grow up and I'm doing the same thing. It's like these programs are playing out, these these perpetuating energies from, from childhood that, you know, could have been passed down through generations as well. And when we understand their programs, we can understand that we can start to change them because like on a computer, we can change a program, but we need to know where the program is and how to get it out of the computer before we reinstall a new one. Yeah, and there's one thing I'd like to highlight here because I think it's, it's really interesting. A lot of people have felt in a sense the same way their entire lives. And I think a lot of people approach the problems and the issues they have in life, not knowing that, that sort of these fundamental changes can, be, can actually be achieved. Because I, 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 I've been so surprised myself about how much change can actually be achieved. I mean, it takes work. I mean, there's absolutely no doubt about that. You know, you really have to be a lot of work and a lot of willingness. But there's like, um, there's so little awareness in, 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 in our society at large of like the, the depth and range of, of human experience and how twisted and sort of... Uh, you know, the, when you're really intense in that craving aversion, how sort of inauthentic and twisted and, and dark and powerful it can get. But at the same time, the opposite direction of how authentic and human you can actually be. Um, well, one thing Matt and I talk about in, in quite a few of our courses, it's like having the air conditioner on in the background, but it's been on like most of your life. And you, so after a certain point, you just forget that the air conditioner is on, it just becomes a normal part of the environment. And so that's what happens with our you know, emotional states and the patterns and everything that we have in life. And so we can only know that the air conditioner is on when it turns off. You're like, oh shit, the air conditioner has been on that whole time. So it's like when we start on that path, it's such an important moment because at some point on the journey, whether it's you know, in a therapy session where I'm working on a trauma or when I'm, I'm at home and I'm you know, doing a meditation or I'm letting go or I'm out playing, whatever it is, it's like we have that moment where all of a sudden the air conditioner gets turned off and we're like, shit has that thing been on the whole time and even though then you know maybe half an hour later it goes back on again we've had a taste of what life could be like without the air conditioner on which gives it gives people so much hope yeah okay it's a moment of insight you know i remember when that first happened for me i was in rehab for the 17th time um you know like i'd spent years going in and out of institutions and prisons and, and all of that sort of stuff and I was, I was in rehab and like I'd found out one of my last friends had died of an, of an overdose. And one of my really good friends who, you know, I'd known for 10, 15 years um, had um, just been sentenced to prison for, 20, for 21 years for, for murder for something he did on ice. Um, and I saw that on the news and I was withdrawing from heroin. And I remember like the anxiety was so bad. I was going to the toilet, trying to make myself vomit up the anxiety. My mind convinced me that if I vomit this up, you know, it'll come out of my body. I, I could feel it in my body and I was trying to uh, get rid of it. And uh, there was this moment I was sitting there and it's like the clouds just parted. And I, for the first time I realized, holy shit, you know, what, how the hell did I get here? It was like reality, well, my reality had just vanished. And I was sitting there and I thought I, I had, 
I have no idea how I got here. You know? And then I saw my whole life play out and I realized, whoa, you know, what the hell? How did that all happen? It all happened unconsciously as a program. I didn't make one decision. It was just playing out. And like I, for the first time, I could see what my life had become, you know, all the things that had happened. I could see it clearly. And it was like the air conditioner got turned off for a moment. And I could hear, you know, all the other sounds that were in the room, like reality sort of came forth. And that was my first moment, you know. And then, like, I, I went to, I uh, spent a year in, in transitional housing and I knew I was going to die if I went back to using. And so I saw a trauma therapist. I did all the group therapies. All, I did 12 step for, you know, two meetings a day for a year. And um, as I worked through my trauma, I remember the first time I had a, had a trauma session, it was like something just moved through and let go. And I, my whole body went, <sighs> and that was the next experience of the air conditioner getting turned off. This hum of unease for a moment regulated, came back down. And I, I said to I said to the guy who I was working with, I said, that's the exact feeling I've been looking for. You know, I get the heroin, put it in my pocket, oh, something eases, you know, something feels okay. Something comes back to, Oh, it's okay now. And so then I kept seeing him. And the more things I worked through, the more my system started to come back to a regulated space. And, and you know, that, like I had an intense amount of trauma. I was like the, on the high level of PTSD. Um, you know, and it took many years for that to come back, but my capacity to be with the stress grew and grew and grew and grew and grew. And now it's like I stress and I come back down, the air conditioner gets turn off, turned off quite quickly. No, um, it's you know, yeah. <laughs> it's like now, now when the air conditioner goes on, it's like oh, the air conditioner's on. It's kind of the the inverse of yeah. what had been happening most of our life. But like that, <laughs> those first few times when it turns off, it just it's such hope because you're like, holy shit, there's this whole other realm of life that I've been cut off from, and it really piques your interest. You're like, well, what else is there? You know, can this can I make this more of a permanent thing? And that's, yeah. and that's great because all of a sudden now at least there's a carrot because people in addiction are like, I could stop using, but life's going to be shit. <laughs> Basically, yes. there's no other carrot there. Yeah, they have no reference experience for just anything approaching a genuine happiness. Yeah, you need that reference. Yeah, because like for me, that the air conditioner had been on since I was about four. At this time, I was about 30. So it's like, oh, I could not remember the air conditioner not being on because it had been on for the vast majority of my life. You know, like a, a, an example of that is when we don't know something's there is like I was a breech birth. So I was the wrong way up and then a C-section. And, I, you know, just through like working through real subtle levels of trauma, I got in a fetal position one day and I was overwhelmed with this feeling I'm stuck. I can't get out. And just this struggle within me. And like I realized, you know, after after doing that, I did that by myself and wow, that has been there my whole life dictating and driving so much of what I do, you know, it's just trying to get unstuck, <laughs> you know, trying to get out, you know. I, then that's I, Yeah, it's really interesting. I had, uh, I had the same experience. So I was a breech birth as well. In a myofascial release session, I had this weird fold, folding over into the same position and then just like all this freaking out. Yeah, yeah. And so then my a lot of my using, I'm not saying that's the only trauma, but, you know, that's like a core trauma because it's birth you know, is then an attempt to get unstuck, you know, an attempt to get out. So then heroin becomes the, oh, I feel out, you know, I feel relief from that stuckness in that moment. And that's like an air conditioner that had been on from the moment I was born that drowned out so much of, you know, what else is happening in the, in the, in life that I didn't even know was there because it was just so normalized. It just became like molded into my being and, and my experience. And that's been just on the um, myofascial session. So as you go into that position and the body starts to shake like that, that's kind of like that, that trauma trying to complete itself from, from, and people are like, what, from when you were born? Yeah, from when you were born. <laughs> like that's how far it goes back. You know, we talk about in the training, you know, pre-conscious and pre-cognitive trauma. So prior to 18 months to two years before that, uh, the visual kind of representation cortex in our brain starts to develop them it's just our body that holds a lot of these memories and so then all of a sudden it comes up in in a trauma session or, or a massage or something and then we go into that same position as the baby and that traumatic imprint starts to 
complete itself. And a lot of people who don't, you know, know a lot about this and do this work, they then resist that and pull away from it again. But if we have a high capacity, we can actually complete a lot of those uh, loops from, from decades previous, which, which is great because they, they want to complete and want to purge. But as human beings, we're not taught how to do that. So, so many of these things get stuck in our system, whether it's from birth or whether it's from an alcoholic father from when we were ages two to four or whether it's bullying at primary school, whatever it is, um, you know, these loops tend to result in these addictive behaviours. Yeah. So I'd like to summarise where we're going, where we, what we've covered so far. Maybe we, maybe we could just touch on a final point about sort of the, the future of addiction. It seems, you know, we've just been talking about how, you know, as you emerge into the world, you're sort of forced down certain avenues to survive, you know, and you've got to repress certain, certain energies, survival energies that come up. So they sort of get stuck in these loops that want to complete, but there's no opportunity for it. And it just, you get everything gets tighter and tighter and tighter and you just need those substances to then briefly like ah relax it and then it then it tightens even more then it's an, another another relaxing and you go round and round until such a point as you meet you meet a matt or orion and they can help you know and you sort of you have to you know, have to turn then back inwards and then sort of go and meet everything that you have um you have you have done and then you can go and live be live an authentic life sculpting broccoli chairs um <laughs> and but i'm really intrigued is because a lot of this stuff isn't really that widely known if you know talk about addiction even in even in certain addiction circles of people who are in recovery you know they really it's it's, it's not very widespread like what what would you think you know it's the year 20 2100 what would you love to see in in sort of the average addiction recovery circle it's um the, or in society as well yeah you know uh, like um like I said before, we hit record. Uh, you know, my first thought is, well, I don't know if we'll make it to twenty one hundred the way we're going. But um, you know, it, it's interesting. You said that like it's not widely known, and it's not. You know, like I, I talk to you know in rehabs in in Melbourne, Victoria. It's like no one would be implementing this stuff. You know, um, this understanding, like the neuroscience behind it, it. It's actually really, really underground, and it's it's actually it's actually in my experience being resisted yeah. by mainstream it's actually being shunned and pushed away because as, as Gabor Mate says, we'd have to change everything. We'd have to change the way we parent. We'd have to change the school systems. We'd have to change, you know, governments. We'd have to change, if everything became trauma informed, we would have to change everything on a really fundamental level. And no one wants to do that, mm. you know? Um, so I can understand the resistance, but, you know, I, I think it's, it's not only essential, but it's inevitable if we're going to survive, you know, it's essential for our survival. And I think if we don't bring this sort of understanding of, of the neuroscience of our survival physiology and what actually drives us as a species, you know, yeah. addiction is a massive issue of humanity. It really, really is. It's what is destroying the planet. It's like, you know, so you I, think your I think your voice cut out there. You said it's a what issue? A collective yes. issue collective issue of humanity you know if you look at say a heroin addict and everyone's like you're destroying your life what are you doing just stop that behavior but they can't stop and a lot of them end up in the ground you know i know a lot of people i've watched them go into the ground and <clears throat> but if we look on a collective level we're destroying the planet we're destroying our home we're destroying species like mass extinction going on climate change all of that sort of stuff but we can't stop it's exactly the same thing playing out within a, the individual heroin addict and the collective uh, system of humanity that we're addicted to. So it's actually the same thing. And so implementing and integrating this understanding into our lives is actually essential for transformation to occur if we're going to survive. You know, otherwise, we will all end up in the ground. Yeah, it's so interesting. I sometimes wonder if, you know, how life patterns, life patterns often are replicated from one level to the other, from the individual to the collective. And just as some addicts, you know, most addicts have to have some kind of personal rock bottom. And I, I you, interested to see, you know, it could be some sort of collective rock bottom coming. They've been predicting it for a while, but perhaps as it would have a similarly, be similarly painful and a similarly sort of severe dislocation, but that would also maybe catalyze transformation. Who knows, so. it's a possibility. That's, that's how hum, humans evolve. That's how life evolves. It's, 
you know, um, like we hit rock bottoms, unfortunately. So contract, expand, contract, expand. That's how, how life evolves. And I think we'll change by catastrophe, not by design. Yeah. Um, that's inevitable, personally. I, you know, I'm not 100% sure on that, but, you know, who, who knows? But um, I think that's what will happen. And it's like we will we'll hit a collective rock bottom and we'll have no choice but to change. It's like that survival grasp that's in us to keep things the way they are is so strong that it almost has to die, you know, be forced to let, let go in order for something new to be born. Um, you know, and that's the resistance that we see to this stuff you know, within the culture, because that grasping, it's like, no, we have to hold on to the way things are. We can't change on such a fundamental level because my sense of identity is invested in the way things yeah, are, right? It's a death. Yeah, it's a kind of death. It, it's experienced as a death. And, you know, like, so I think like that, that that will happen. But just back to, I went a bit off topic, that back to the 2100 recovery, you know, um, I would like to see it trauma-informed. I would like to see like a real compassionate approach to recovery and really, really understanding that this isn't a choice. These are these are just survival instincts. Uh, su sorry, survival physiology playing out. It's it's a response to trauma. It's not just a lack of willpower and lack of morality, and it's not something to shame. It's just something to be understood, you know. And so I, I would like to see that integrated, that understanding of of trauma and the nervous system integrated through twelve step programs. You know, through rehabs, I'd like to see it integrated into governments, into media, into all of that, you know, as a, like, I think in um, Gabor Mate's movie, it's, it's all, all about creating a trauma informed society, you know, trauma informed world. That's where I'd like to see it go. Yeah. I'm not really attached to that. You know? <laughs> I hear you, man. Brian, and yeah, I, I, I agree. Yeah, I agree with the pretty much all that, that Matt said, you know, I would hope that, you know, we really as a collective do just look at this. The, the, the ideas keep evolving. We spoke about on an individual level, we have individual beliefs and parts of our identity and personality, and they can take maybe years to, to fall away if we're truly committed to changing them. And on a collective level, it just takes longer. You know, we have these group beliefs as cultures and they tend to just take a long time to evolve and change. And addiction, you know, it was believed to be a choice. And a lot of people still believe that just a moral failing and bad decisions. The judicial system still sees it that way. You know, Matt and I both went through the judicial system and I was made to feel like a complete idiot who kept making bad choices. And I was further guilted and shamed, which would drive me deeper into addiction. So it's like, you know, we're trying to, we're hopefully trying to solve a problem of addiction with our judicial system, but we're actually making it worse because the belief is just incorrect. Then we have our medical system, which sees it as a disease. So does the 12 step groups, which is an evolution from a choice or a moral failing. It's better. It opens people up to getting treatment, but it still falls short, you know, of the mark. And I hope that, you know, that there's a tribe in, I believe it's Africa and what they do when someone in the tribe uh, is pregnant and this baby is going to be born. There's a person in the tribe who creates a song for that baby. It's called their soul song. And it's individual to that person. And they teach that to the whole tribe. And when the baby's born, they sing the soul song to this baby to welcome it into the world. And then what happens, let's say that baby grows up in as an adult and it starts acting out or behaving inappropriately, which is kind of what addiction, right? Instead of, you know, let's say that that person grows up and they start acting out by throwing rocks at other people of the tribe. Right now, in our society, the way we would see it, we would take the person and put them in a, a cage, you know, maybe made of wood and stuff, and put them in a cage, and we'd try and get rid of rocks and make them illegal. Right? Fucking stupid. Right? What they do in this, it's the same with drugs. Like the fact that we demonize an inanimate object is just ridiculous. You know, that's what happens. Someone, oh, they're addicted to ice. It's like, well, either the person gets demonized or the drug or both which doesn't help at all on an individual or a collective level. So in this tribe, what they would do when someone transgresses, they see that as this is where we started the conversation. They've gotten away from their authentic self. Yeah. They've gotten away from who they truly are in their heart and their soul. So what happens in those moments, the tribe gathers, literally surrounds that person and sings them their soul song to remind them who they are. 
This is a compassionate and understanding approach to something we would deem to be a bad behavior. Now, I would like to see, we're not gonna do that exact same thing because we're living in too much of a large culture, but I would love addiction treatment and recovery to have that same energy and theme behind it of compassion, of understanding, of trying to realize this person is in extreme pain and we need to help them out of that pain and remind them who they are. You know, I've, I've seen so many people over the years who, because we're stuck in this, you know, capitalistic society, it's like, I wanted to stop working for a month or two and literally commit myself and get myself back on track, but I can't. I have no support from my parents. They're not around. I have this mortgage I have to pay. So I'm just going to keep using every morning and stay on that hamster wheel of my job. And people don't have the space to be able to really commit to themselves, which I'm hoping we pour so much more resources into in the year 2100. And also different therapies as well, because right now we're in the process of saying, yes, mental health is a real issue. Let's put more money into it. We put more money into the shit that doesn't get results. Whereas people need a menu of options because everyone's path to recovery is unique. It's like a fingerprint. There might be the same themes, but it is individual at the end of the day. Yeah, totally agree with that's that. If we, that's if we make it. <laughs> Yeah, just like, like when you were talking, like we can finish after this, but what came up was like trauma becoming societal structures. And, you know, these societal structures are what makes us feel safe. And I tried to imagine, you know, like say everyone in here, rural Victoria surrounding me and singing the song, you know, to me. And it's, it's not going to happen because everyone's own trauma would get in the way. You know, um, it's like we have to resolve trauma within everyone. That's why addiction also isn't just about the person who's using. It's like the whole family has trauma bonding and trauma patterns that are playing out in their relationship to the child. And this is where it's it has to be a holistic approach. It has to be, you know, everyone in a, in a sense. So that's why that if, if the group belief changes enough and we're talking well, hell, that's like 80 years away. I don't know, maybe. But like, because right now, if I get born into this world, I'll pick up on group beliefs. So if I have no experience of addiction myself or anyone that I know closely, I pick up the group belief. So I might just go, oh, it's a shit choice. That's a, an idiot who makes a bad decision. So I would love to see the point where all of a sudden a, a child who gets brought up who hasn't experienced addiction or anyone close to them that has picks up the group belief, oh my God, this is a human being in extreme pain. We need to help them. Because when the, when the collective believes that, you know, I start to get goosebumps thinking about that. Because when the collective believes that, the stigma goes, the guilt and shame goes. And we're able to really help people when, when we remove those states. Yeah, that's, that's an amazing insight, I think. Yeah, looking at that world with just uh, subtle shifts how deep, very deep, but very subtle shifts in just how we view other human beings, this understanding of, okay, it's the pain and just almost seeing, seeing into the pain in all these other, watching it. I notice when you learn, some, learn about this stuff, you can almost start to see it everywhere. You can see the pain, like, a, like the network of it. Just, just You see the matrix. <laughs> see, yeah, in, in a sense, yeah. It sounds, it sounds like a bit of an exaggeration, but it's not true. You see people on the street arguing and you can just see the whole system you know, lit up with survival physiology. And it's just like and you see, you see two humans that actually want to hug each other and love, but they won't allow themselves to because they're too caught up in the weeds. Yeah, yeah. Because what, what else does anyone want? You know, it's like going back to what we talked about at the beginning. You know, would you rather have this or this? Would you have love or anything else? Like it's <laughs> sort of a no-brainer. Anyway, chaps, we've uh, we've got a bit of a time, but it's been uh, it's been uh, a pleasure talking to you. I think we were we were just at really getting on a roll there. Actually, <laughs> that, was, that was some great stuff. Um, so I will put the details of, of uh, you know, both Matt and Ryan, uh, their, their course and body processing, which I'd highly recommend, and a link to my own website. There's all sorts of good stuff that will be in the description. Um, and I thank you both for joining me for this great conversation. And uh, yeah, take care, everybody. Thanks, Ben.